All right, Joshua chapter 10. Remember, this is where the Israelites uh, honored their covenant treaty with the Gibeonites uh, in spite of the fact that they had been tricked into that treaty with them. But they honor it because there are five kings that get together to go and attack the Gibeonites. The Israelites make a surprise attack. On them, the day the sun stood still, God responded with hail, and so they won a victory here. They were able to attack and defeat multiple enemies in this particular campaign for taking the land of Canaan. Uh, in 28, Joshua 10, verses 28, and following on down through there, you have the southern campaign laid out, and from this point forward through really the, toward the end of the book to, to the last few chapters there, it really accelerates and just gives a very brief summary and overview of here's where they went, here's what they conquered, here's the area they took, and, and things like that. And so we're going to move very rapidly through all of this. But I do want to read Joshua 10, 40, and... 42, 40, and then verse 42. Does anybody want to get that for us? Joshua 10, verse 40. Jim. So Joshua conquered all the land, the mountain country and the south and the lowland and the wilderness slopes, and all their kings who left none remain, but utterly destroyed all that breathed, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded. And Joshua conquered them and catered Barnea, And Joshua returned, and all Israel with him to the camp of Gilgal. Okay. So they, remember, went in Jericho, which was essentially uh, midway up Canaan land as far as north and south. Uh, so from your perspective, they, they cross over the Jordan, they come in, and they press on in to Ai and Bethel and take them and the Gibeonites were a little south of Jerusalem there, and so they've taken that, and then it was the king of Jerusalem, remember, that had formed this alliance against them. But it's just simply saying they essentially cut the country in half and swept through the south end, and this is summarizing it for us, killed all those people, and now they're going back to their camp at Gilgal. So that southern campaign is essentially done at this point. Well, question number five on that worksheet, I had just asked what territory of Canaan was captured during the battles of Joshua chapter 11. If they took the south in 10, of course, what did they take in 11? North. Okay. All right. Verses 1 through 9 here talk about a part of this conquest that they're doing and there's a group of people again that amass against the Israelites. In verse 4, it says that they, all their armies, as many as the people of sand, which is in the seashore in multitude, very many horses and chariots. And so this is a larger, more formidable force that they're facing here. And in verse 6, let's read that, Joshua 11, verse 6. Who will get that for us, Elijah? Okay, so God gives him reassurance. That, and this would indicate Joshua has a measure of concern about this when God's communicating to his people, and particularly in this kind of thing, you know, don't be afraid, just like he does with Paul in Corinth in 1 Corinthians, uh, or rather Acts chapter 18. You know, he told him, don't be afraid, I have many people in this city. Well, there, there's evidently some trepidation on the part of the individual about, what they're facing, what's before them. And God's just reassuring him here, I'm still with you. Everything so doesn't matter about the size of that force. And so you drop down to verse 9, it says, So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. In other words, he's just simply saying, 
God told him to do this. He's continuing to do it. They're continuing to remain faithful, to follow God's plan. And as they do that, they have success all along the way. And that's the formula, of course, for success is simply submitting to God's will. In verse 15, uh, Carter, you want to read that, Joshua eleven fifteen. 15? Okay, Any, anything you can pull out of that? I've got one point to make out of it, but Mike? Okay, and God had laid down this plan essentially through Moses. He, he had been telling his people he was going to send them in there. Of course, initially they refused, but now they're going in, they're doing it. This plan had been laid out as far as go in, conquer the land, take the people. Moses had revealed that, and that directive had not changed in the intervening years, and Joshua is still respecting that command that was given to him through Moses from God. Exactly, exactly right. And so he's respecting what had gone before. Uh, he heeded what God had told him at the beginning of the book, that be strong and courageous. Don't depart from this law to the right hand or to the left hand. And so he's, he's doing that as he's going through as the new leader, as Mike said, uh, of Israel. Let's read Joshua eleven twenty three. Who's got that? Joshua eleven twenty three. Go ahead, Philip. Okay, so here you have this really this summary statement. He's taken the land. He gives it to them by division now. In chapter 12 and going forward, there's going to be some more details given to us about this conquering, about the division of the land. But it's simply saying, look, he went in, he did exactly what God had commanded him to do. They were successful in this. Any other thoughts before we press on? I know we're moving rapidly. All right, so question number six I had asked, how many kings were defeated by Joshua? And you can just skip to Joshua 12, 24. Thirty-one. All right. What is this representing? From what you know about Joshua, some of the things you've read, things we haven't particularly mentioned just yet, but what's this a picture of? Defeating the thirty-one kings. How, how were these, why is it that when we talk about the land of Canaan, it says there's 31 kings in this land? You fast forward to 1 Samuel chapter 10, and you have one king over this territory, Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. But here you have 31 kings. Maybe too vague. City-states. These are city-states in the land of Canaan. It's not one united territory, but it, there are city-states with the kings over them. And it's simply saying they've gone in and they've taken the strongholds that were in the land of Canaan. They haven't cleared out every village, you know, every little town, every little wayside stop of a few little huts or homes or whatever it may be. It's simply that this large campaign through the south and then coming around through the north, that they've taken out 
the sizable armies, the leaders of the people. They, they've taken those walled towns and cities. And so the bulk of the work is done. Just like in modern warfare, a, an army is going to go in and they're going to look at where are the strongholds. We've got to take those. We have to hold those. And we take those one by one, and then they'll turn their attention to the smaller things that are out in the countryside or whatever else they may, did, may need to take care of. But that's what they've done here with these 31 kings. Much of the rest of the land is still unconquered and dealt with. And that's what the tribes, when they are given their allotments and the territories, that's their charge. Go in, and you need to finish driving these people out. Well, we know, of course, that that doesn't exactly happen, and we'll touch on some of those maybe as we go forward. But let's look now at Joshua chapter 13 as there's this preparation to divide the land. Let's read Joshua 13, verses 1 and 2. Who will get that for us? Joshua 13, 1 and 2. Go ahead, Carter. Okay, and it goes on listing those down, but it's various territories throughout that land, as we were just talking about, that still need to be taken, including that area or the territory of the Philistines. Uh, verse 7, who will grab verse 7 for us? Mike, you want to get that for us? Okay, so it's talking about this territory west of the Jordan is to be divided up among the nine and a half tribes. And so that area east has already been allotted out to um, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, and the rest of it needs to be allotted out to the remainder of them. And it says it's going to be done by lots is how they're going to do it. So part of that is in verse 6, talking about by lots, they're, they're going to depend on the Lord in his providence to figure out where these territories are. And we'll dig a little bit more into that in a moment. But verse 14, it makes specific mention, of course, of one of the tribes in their situation. Who will read Joshua 13, 14 for us? Find you. Okay, so they don't have a specific territory, and we're going to come back to that in a little bit when we talk about Simeon. But these nine and a half, they've got a place, a territory. The tribe of Levi is not going to have that, but they're going to have cities. Uh, question number one, why would Balaam be mentioned in verse 22? Let's read verse 22, then answer that question. Joshua 13, 22, who's got that? Go ahead, Jim. The children of Israel also built with the sword Balaam, the son of Beor, the soothsayer, among those who were killed by them. Okay. So why would it mention Balaam here? Okay, so you go back to the book of Numbers and this King Balak hired Balaam to come down and curse Israel. And Balaam's described as a prophet of God. And he tries, he wants to do that, but God won't allow him. And God overruled him and made him bless Israel instead of cursing them. And as Mike said, he figured out a, another way and advised Balak, we'll get them involved in idolatry and God himself will punish them. And you read about that in Numbers chapter 25, uh, where that unfolded. Anything interesting that you maybe draw from this? Why the writer of Joshua comes back and includes this message here, Mike? Yeah. 
Yes, yes. I, and the New King James has soothsayer there, but it's the same uh, connotation in that, hey, uh, this guy's a bad guy. Um, he's not a representative of God. And so uh, God brought about a punishment on this man who tried to destroy his people who were standing against his people and caused his people to sin. He, he was a, the impetus of that. The people were accountable, as Numbers 25 shows, and God punished them for that. But here this man is being held responsible as well, and he lost his life over it. Remember that when he initially went to Balak's call, he thought he was going to be very rich. And Balak offered him many riches. But he ends up being killed over what he had gotten involved in. So a great cautionary tale there, if you will. Any other thoughts? All right, Mike. Yeah. Every single thing that God could have done, he did it with not with the Lord's permission. Right. Yeah. He he just stubbornly pressed on because he was materialistic, as the New Testament says, in the greed of Balaam. He was a greedy materialistic man, and it cost him everything. All right, so Joshua chapter 14, we get into the division of the land west of the Jordan. And again, it's by Lot, verses 1 and 2, explain that. But I want to get into this portion about Caleb and talking about him. So let's please read a little bit longer section, Joshua 14, verses 6 through 15. Who will get that for us? Verses 6 through 15. Zach. Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, these forty five years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel walked with their house. And now, behold, I am this day eighty five years old. I am still as strong today as I was on the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then, for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the enemy came on you with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him, and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb. All right. So question number two, what city did Caleb receive as a part of his inheritance and why? What lesson can we draw from this? So what city? Okay. Hebron or Hebron. Um, why did he receive that? Who, who are the Anakim? Giants. They're, they're ones who are described as the giants. Okay, so what does this tell you about Caleb? He's 85. Forty years old, Joshua, and 
knows that I can put my American flag and show you rightly they say they can. Yeah, any other thoughts? Good thoughts. He he's a bit of a scrappy guy. <laughs> right? I'm 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 ready. Let's go. I give me that inheritance and, and I'll fight. I, I'm not bothered by those guys. The Lord will be with me. I, it'll all be fine. So yeah. So and and this is remember in verse six begins the children of Judah, the people of Judah. He's of the tribe of Judah. This city is within the territory of Judah. It's the first capital where David reigned as king. If you fast forward in their history to 2 Samuel chapter 5, David ruled as king there in Hebron. Let's, in fact, let's just jump over to 2 Samuel 5 and notice verses 1 through 5, just what it says about this beginning of the reign. 2 Samuel 5, 1 through 5, who's got that? Caesar? Okay, so <clears throat> it, it has this, I would say, an illustrious history by the time you get down to David because Caleb, he's, he's one of the guys that stood head and shoulders above the rest of the Israelites. That's a man of faith. This is his territory. That's the city he specifically received. And, and so David, being of the tribe of Judah, when he ascends to the throne, that's his capital within the territory in that city. And it's not till later after seven years that he moves his capital to Jerusalem. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But this is the beginning or it's sort of the introduction as far as Israel and their control of this city and what's done there in the biblical account. And he received it, as you said, because he was faithful to the Lord. And it teaches us that when we are submissive to God's will, we believe in Him, we execute His commands in our life, He rewards us. And we're not saying that you and I are going to get a city given to us, but simply the blessing that God intends with the command that He gives is what we're going to receive. The blessing He intended with Caleb and Joshua and the others all the way back in Numbers chapter 13 is go in and take the land. Well, Caleb believed that. And then this promise had been made, which, by the way, this promise is revealed here. It's not revealed before this. But this promise was made all those years ago that you're going to receive wherever you go in that land. That's yours, Caleb. You, you can claim it. It's yours. You stake out your territory, if you will. And so he received that. He trusted in God and was blessed as a result. Great lesson for us. And it didn't matter about the Anakim, doesn't matter about the giants, the challenges, doesn't matter about the timeline. He says, you know, I was 40 when I went in, and now I'm 45 or 85. All these years intervening, I received it. Zach. In a sense, we will receive the city. In, <laughs> in, the, same, in the way Abraham in Hebrews 11 was long for the yes. country. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, we're looking for the heavenly city. Exactly right. Very good. All right, so anybody, did anybody trace out the timeline of the invasion? This is where we do it, based on Caleb's age. Okay. 
Remember, the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. They go to Sinai, and they're at Sinai about a year. And then they pick up and they begin to move and they work their way up to the southern edge of Canaan. That's when the spies are sent in and they come back. It's estimated, and, and I couldn't verify for certain, but it's estimated that entire process about two and a half years. And if you look at Caleb's age when he goes into Canaan as a spy at 40, and now it's 45 years later, and you figure the children of Israel a total of 40 years in the desert, and you mash out all those numbers, the campaign to take the land was about seven and a half years. You know, we read through this, we read through, you know, chapter 10, 11, 12, and we think, it's done. But it's seven and a half years. That's a long time. And they were constantly in war going through that time. Generally, in ancient warfare, they would, be, they would have a campaigning season from springtime into the fall. They would rest in the winter, just couldn't logistically handle moving around and things. I'm assuming that's similar to what they did here. But seven and a half years going through, it's been a long slog for these men. And you think about it, he's 85 years old, but one of the things he mentions that's interesting you know, I'm just as strong now as I was then. Reminds you of who? Moses. Remember, at 120, his strength had not diminished. He was a strong man. Um, but here he is. He says, here I am, the 85 years old. I want my land. Please give it to me after that long, extended time of battle. Any other thoughts there? All right, chapter 15, you have essentially inheritance highlights going from chapter 15 forward, really through chapter 21. We're just going to touch on a couple of things here. First of all, you've got, you know, Judah uh, being mentioned about all their territories. And it goes on to give more details about Caleb and all of that. Uh, Ephraim and West Manasseh, it talks about chapter 16. Chapter 17 is where I want to come down to, verses 14 through 18. As it's talking about, it's talking about Joseph's inheritance, but of course Joseph was split between Ephraim and Manasseh because they were so large, and of course Jacob originally back in Genesis had adopted them as his sons. So that's why they're getting this territory and Joseph split in two. But let's please read Joshua 17, verses 14 through 18. Who will get that for us, Elijah? Go ahead. Hey, what's going on here? How is this compared to Caleb in his attitude? And who are these two tribes, Ephraim, and even half-tribe Manasseh? Granted, it's half-tribe, but Ephraim, Manasseh, they're, they're two of the largest tribes among all the Israelites, and they're saying, they're just complaining about 
their lot, literally their lot. They're complaining about that. And he's saying, just go. If, if you're great, hey, we're great people. Okay, if you're great people, then go and attack them. Don't make excuses. Don't complain. Get out there and get to it. So, and this was really true of all those tribes when they went into their territory. They had to go in and they had to clean the people out. They, they had to keep doing that. Uh, there was a note back in verse 13 where it says they, they grew strong. They put the Canaanites to force tribute, but they did not utterly drive them out. So they, they were strong enough to exert their will on them, but they didn't fully complete it. And here is kind of that idea, hey, we really, we're kind of tired of having these fights and doing this. We're not going to keep going. Yes, yes. And so there's, there's the initial work that has to be done that was very serious, very heavy lifting, but then there's the ongoing work that has to be done, just like in the life of a child of God, to come to that point of being convicted, of repenting of our sins, becoming a Christian, and beginning to grow. And then there's the, the daily growth and service to God through time, year after year, and we just, that's the nature of it. All right, um, let's look at Joshua chapter 18 now. Joshua 18, Joshua gives an admonition to the seven and a half tribes, I think it is, seven tribes here. And let's read, how about verses one through nine here? One through nine. Who's got that? Go ahead, Philip. Okay, so first of all, just note that it says that the tabernacle is there at Shiloh. This is the tabernacle of meeting. Um, there's indication about some things later we're going to notice about Shechem, but the tabernacle's here. And remember, this is where Samuel was. When you get to the book of Samuel, Samuel was in Shiloh. And so they've set the tabernacle up here. This is where they're coming together for their observance of the law and offering the sacrifices. This is where the, the priests are operating with the altars and burning of incense, all those things. So they're there and he's, he's admonishing them, verse 3, and you need to go and, and take your territory. You need to go possess it. So sends them on the surveying mission. Survey that out. Come back and we'll determine by lot who gets which territory. So Let's just notice, I know this is kind of small, but to get the whole thing in, it just kind of is what it is. But you can see on the east, Manasseh, Gad, Reuben, and then on the west side of the Jordan, Judah down toward the south. We'll talk about Simeon in a minute. But then 
Ephraim and Manasseh are kind of in the north, as it said here. They're going to remain in the north. But there's that whole territory, go and the remainder of that territory where these tribes, where Judah is not, where Ephraim and Manasseh are not, go survey that. So they're surveying the various areas. Now, Dan ends up moving up to the north. And the book of Judges talks a little bit about that. But there's the, the territories as they're allotted out to Israel. Um, anything else? Any other thoughts? Okay, so let's get down to Joshua 18, verse 11, and then verse 28. Joshua 18, 11, and 28. Who will get those two verses for us? Carter, you want to get that? Please. Okay, so question three, very simply, what tribe received Jerusalem as a part of their inheritance? Benjamin, right. Okay. I don't know if you ever had the impression, but the impression I had at one time was, well, Jerusalem belongs to Judah. Here it clearly states that they get Jebus, which is Jerusalem, verse 28. That's, that's the territory that they receive. And, it, and I wanted to bring it out just simply for the fact that when you get into the United Kingdom, you understand some of the dynamics there. You understand why when David was on the throne in Jerusalem, when he eventually moved there, and then his son Absalom rebelled against him, he went to Hebron to declare that he was king now. He went to the city where David initially was king. And so you had rival capitals, if you will. He, he Obviously, Absalom had a lot of support in the city of Hebron at that time. And uh, he, he thought, well, I've got me a power base down here and a legitimacy of a ruling capital city that I can challenge my father and I'll go up and drive him out of Jerusalem, and, and then I'll have the whole thing. But anyways, that's just a little bit of that background behind those things. Any other thoughts there? All right, question number four. Let's go to Joshua 19, verse 1. Joshua 19, verse 1. Who's got that? Just one little verse. Elijah. Okay, so Simeon is a relatively smaller tribe. Uh, the territory of Judah, you go through it all, it, it was a very large territory. And so Simeon could settle within Judah and they not be overcrowded. Now the question is, question number four, not only where did they settle, but why? Why did this happen? Let's go back to Genesis 49, and let's read here verses 5 through 7, please. Genesis 49 and 5 through 7. Who will get that for us? Carter? Okay, does anybody know what happened? Well, we know Levi, right? The tribe of Levi, the Levites, they don't receive a territory. They have cities. They're scattered throughout the land. So that's part of that there. But does anybody know what happens with Simeon over time? Yeah, they just really melt into Judah. They, they're just dissolved, essentially. They really don't have their territory. They don't have a distinct identity. And 
they just kind of go away. But that's, that's part of that fulfillment of that prophecy. So they settle inside of Judah. And Judah's so overwhelming, they just really become absorbed in them. Fulfillment of that prophecy made all the way back there in Genesis chapter 49. All right, any other thoughts down through 19, chapter 19? And I know we're moving quick. All right, so chapter 20 is the city of, of refuge and the cities for the Levites going into chapter 21. We're not going to go through that in detail. But I do want to look at verses uh, Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45. Who will read that for us? 43. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, question five I had asked, why is it important to note God fulfilled his promise, promises to Israel? Definitely. Anything else? One, God does not fail. He works things out in his time. So where would you connect these verses in the biblical record up to this point? Where would you see connecting points? What does this ultimately trace back to? Jim? Genesis 12. Genesis chapter 12. Okay. When did Abram live? Does anybody know? Roughly. It's around 2000 B.C., right? Around 2000 B.C. And the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt around some say mid-1400s B.C. So... Some 550 years later, remember, they would spend 400 years down in the land and all of that. From That's from Jacob's you know, migration down in there to them coming out as a nation. But you, So you've got those intervening centuries, but God had told Abram, I'm going to give you this land. It's going to be yours. Abram didn't possess it himself. He bought a piece of land, but he didn't receive it as a possession and inheritance. Isaac didn't. Jacob didn't. Even though they lived and dwelt in that land, they hadn't received it. The children of Israel come out. All these things unfold in the desert, but now they eventually go on this campaign through the land, and here it states definitively, God brought them into the land. They've received exactly what he said he was going to give to them. He's fulfilled his word. He's not failed in that. How, how does that impact modern religious thinking and beliefs that we hear from people around us? Well, they, yeah, they ignore the New Testament, and most of Israel today ignores God altogether. There are a lot of secular humanist, atheist uh, people over there. But the, the concept that's included within premillennialism is God never has fulfilled this promise and there is some point in the future where God is going to transport all Jews into the land of Canaan, and they're going to have that possession. And that, maybe you realize this, maybe you haven't, that is what's behind U.S. foreign policy with Israel. Why we spent billions and billions of dollars supporting Israel, 
There, there were people from, was it 1948, they thought, oh, it's now going to happen. And there's people still expecting it, but it's a false hope. Right here it says God gave it to him. Not one word failed. Not, not a single thing that God had told them concerning this land, them taking that land, possessing that land failed. They had it. That's it. Any other thoughts? Yes, very good way to to highlight what uh, Romans fifteen four says in summary. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, for the pa- through the patience and comfort of the scriptures. You know we. We have this here seeing that God consistently fulfilled his promises and every promise he's made to us will be fulfilled. Exactly right. And to deny that this was fulfilled undermines the veracity and the character of God. It really is blasphemy when you come right down to it. All right, Lord willing, we'll look at 22 to 24 next week.